This is, uh, yeah, like I said, this is going to be a little more janky compared to usual. I will be able to see myself a little less than usual. So I'm sorry if anything goes horribly wrong and I don't notice for forever. I have my chat. <laughs> I can't show you this without messing up my tripod balancing act. But chat is a phone. It's just sitting, like, where you see my face right now, that's where my phone is sitting, delivering my chat. <laughs> and, uh... What's really going to happen is that my phone's going to tip and slide down, hit the power button, and the stream will be over. <laughs> so we're just setting up for success everywhere tonight. Um, yeah. But we're, you know, we're getting in the remote streaming practice that we need, I think. Maybe. I might never do this again. <laughs> but that means when you look at my messages, you'll be looking directly into my soul. Uh, yes. I mean, that's that's really always the case. Everyone's soul is an open book to me. Let's see. So, I suppose we should just get started so I can stop this weird intro train wreck that has happened so far. <laughs> um, last time, my players just started their journey into this dungeon that I've been working on for the last couple of streams. The, uh, you know, we've kept just a step, a step in front of the players, really. I have a cat here. We'll see if they pop up. We'll see if they claw me horribly and I shout out in pain, which is really the likely result. Um, so we've been working on filling out this dungeon, getting it ready, drawing it up, filling it with stuff. And they take their first brave steps inside. They... <laughs> Don the mask that they got from the head cultist, and uh, they they sneak past all the guards. That's really what happened at the start of the last session. They took a long time, as you should, scouting out these first couple of rooms. They didn't even they didn't check this hallway. They just kind of like looked around here. They went over here, um, and they one of the characters just pretended to be the head uh, priestess from the Church of Denala and managed to bluff incredibly well that she was exactly where she should be and that she was like bringing new cultists in to uh to convert and they basically bypassed all of these guards all of them um with a little help they like snuck into this room i gave them a knife that basically when it when you deal like one non-lethal damage with it when you do deal some like, not real damage. If you do actual damage, it doesn't work. But when you deal non-lethal damage, it has a chance to um, charm the person for a certain amount of time. And so they snuck into this room, and they, like, with this ceremonial dagger, pricked the necks of all three of the guards, and two of them failed their shape, as will happen. Um... So when they ran into those guards later, um, they were able to pretty easily bluff their way into this whole, um, I am Misha, the head priestess of the church, and you should get out of our way, really. So they <laughs> made their life for this first part pretty easily, easy because of that. They kind of cruised through a lot of this. Um, and yeah, I... You know, I didn't feel like it. I threw challenges in their way. I'm, I threw complications like, you know, they had the first guard, like, give them a little tour, show them, uh, show them the supply room and, like, where they keep their prisoners. And then the guard was like, we don't know anything about the rest of the temple. We don't have jurisdiction over anything but, like, this corner. This is what we guard. You know, nothing else is, uh, in our purview so then they said all right we're done with you then shoo back to your business and basically said tell the other guards not to get in our way <laughs> so that prompted the other guards to be like whoa this sounds kind of weird actually this sounds kind of sketchy and you're a little looped out so we're gonna go uh check out what you're saying um successful yeah not not familiar with the successful bluffing concept yeah it usually doesn't go so well they did have all the tools they needed to make it work i gave them a mask a 
the Persona mask that gives them, like, I don't remember the exact details, but it gives some kind of boost to pretending you are someone else. Um, yeah. So they had the correct tools to get this done, really. Um, they'd kind of done their due diligence, clearing out the other dungeons to make it as easy as possible. Um, so yeah, they slipped by these guards. They investigated kind of the rest of the dungeon, um, bumped into this emissary down here, which is basically, in short terms, uh, this is like a paladin for another uh, demigod kind of across the way. I always, when I do these, I'm always like, how much recap do I need to do? Um, but the general idea, the super fast version, which I think it's a, it's going to be okay to start giving that out, is just that the gods are gone, all the mortals sealed them away, and as a result of those four original gods being uh, just gone from the world, other powerful beings are being elevated up to, like, demigod status. Um, so this creature works for one such demigod, and it was just a way to introduce that, like, hey, there's this, like, um, Gerudo-like character <laughs> to just steal some Final Fantasy lore. Um, just, like, fighting another main villain in the campaign. There's, like, this creature called Salamander that is invading on the player's city's territory, and this creature, uh, this demigod, is fighting kind of back against them kind of like rallying the folks in that area. And this is just a way to introduce that to say, it's just a hook, really. Like, here's this conflict going on somewhere else. This person might be useful to you later. Um, and uh, they discovered that this creature is not so impressed with Explicita Defilus, the, uh, the main kind of demigod in this dungeon that has taken over this town, that has uh, embedded this cult in the town of Orlane. And basically said here i'm just going to give you this scroll of truth without really explaining just said truth is the enemy of explicita and gave them that scroll and then peaced out and just started getting the uh the offerings given to them by the cult here and they they just left um and as they're going through this dungeon i'm like dropping some hints we kind of set some we did some world building together and just some like shared ideas that people thought would be cool and there was like this idea of ancient buried ruins which you know a plus check mark it's uh, on the list it's here it exists and the other one was like ancient floating cities which tie into the buried ruins um it's like part of the lore that we created together in a wonderful game called microscope and for the people who have been here every stream sorry if you're getting sick of hearing this over and over um and yeah, so there have been hints that this is maybe one of those floating cities. There's a lot of like construction, a lot of uh, thin glass framing. Like these used to be windows, these used to be windows, these like kind of domed windows that people don't make with their current construction methods. Same with like this hallway was like just a big glass hallway and this was like a vaulted glass structure that has been caved in. And part of this joint world building was the anti-dragon racism, right? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. That uh, <laughs> that limitation that has become already <laughs> infamous in chat. Um. So yeah, they they met this paladin and their guard uh, without you know they got through that encounter without too much incident. They're like, okay. Um, I think they kind of came off of that encounter feeling like, well, this was kind of weird. I don't really know what the point of this was. Um, and I feel like I could have done a better job of making it pointed and just less of like a random conversation. But in my defense, I didn't think that they would go here, bypass all the guards, and then straight down to the emissary. <laughs> I kind of thought they would check out some of this, check out some of this, maybe over here. Maybe this is the last room they get to on this floor or like close to it, you know? Maybe they don't do this until they're coming back out. So having it be the first encounter, like they do some lying, 
They go down here, and they meet a, you know, demigod paladin. Like, maybe, you know, that was perhaps a little underwhelming of a way to come to that conclusion, but uh, I just kind of, you know, wanted to play it the way that I had in my head and went for it. And, you know, it's all good. All good practice. Good roleplay practice for me. Um, they... There, there was opportunity to run into, like, uh, roaming monsters in here. But since they were being escorted around by guards already, and guards were on the encounter list, I did roll guards later when they kind of split off. I just kind of didn't have them run into any of these um, while they were walking around with guards. And, yeah, they, they managed to... They almost got in a fight here. Like, uh, I placed this little crocodile encounter there at random from a roll, and uh, they just managed to avoid the combat and, like, walk away instead of, uh, you know, walking straight into the crocodile. So, let's see. What... Where did they go from there? Yeah, so after sneaking around, they found their way right to the officer's quarters. They <laughs> were just hitting the checkboxes of, like, the actual cultist minions and not of any of the other things, other uh, um, hazards in here. They didn't hit the beaver thing. I was really sad. <laughs> but uh, they came up here. They ran into some of the lieutenants. And again, pretending to be Misha, this head cleric, they like enlisted the help of one, and then enlisted the help of another, and the person who was pretending to be Misha was like, uh, I told them that <laughs> you're sitting here, lying out your ass, pulling all this stuff out, like just, you know, making it up as you go along. You can kind of tell that this guy's doing the same. This uh, Ben Griff guy. And they're like, uh, weird, okay. So they, like, send off they basically say, all right, uh, <laughs> Blaze Gabar, the other lieutenant that they uh, they enlisted to like guide them to Explicita, said, all right, you go show them where Explicita is, which confused him because he's like, well, that's that's not even on this floor. Like, I have to go. I'm not allowed to go there. But okay, I'm gonna just I'm gonna follow your orders to the best of my ability. Um, and they get on a boat and they leave the other two players behind and uh, travel across. And yep, <laughs> just kind of peace out for a while. Um, and then the, the other player sits back and they're like, hey, what's, uh, so if I promise to get you, like, if I promise to get you out of here alive, you tell me what's going on, like what your deal is. And they're like, uh, okay, sure. <laughs> um, and through this conversation, like, the character who is pretending to be Misha, their actual name is Eve, they, like, take off their mask and introduce themselves, and the other character's like, oh, I, I know you, we know each other, where, you trained at the Assassin's Guild, I trained you at the Assassin's Guild uh, in Eden, and Eve was like, yes, yeah, that was me, um, so she got a nice hook there, she Seemed to enjoy that. It was like it was a, it was a pretty cool conversation, um, and yeah, again they just bypassed this entire this entire fight, and I start to get a little conflicted here. I'm like, oh, they're they're getting by a lot of my stuff. I need to hmm, I need to make them fight something. I I do. I I need to do this, um, and I sometimes feel like that urge is wrong. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I had them, I had just Eve and just Ben Griff run into a group of guards coming back this way. So I brought in a dragon. Exactly. Exactly. I brought in a dragon. Um, now they ran into like a set of guards and just another, just one more complication of like, all right, we're split up from the party. What do we do? Um, and again, they just, they role played through it pretty well. They rolled well. They had a good little speech to like, get the guards to go away. I was like, all right, I'll, you know, I'll give you that. And, 
you know, as the goblin was rowing back across to fetch them, the other players on the other side, I did almost have a crocodile eat him. I was just getting bloodthirsty. I was like, he is rowing across. He thinks he's safe because the, the priestess normally, like, the priestess tamed all of the creatures here. That is her specialty. That is what Explicita made her good at. Um, and so, like, everyone's expecting when they are around her that these creatures are going to be docile. They're going to be, like, good-natured <laughs> in comparison to their normal bitey nature. And I probably could have hinted at that better. I could have had more of them show up and be a little snappy, be a little agitated, and hint, you know, just, like, hint at that a little more. But, uh it's fine. It works out. Um, this was kind of a thing I was realizing in retrospect of like, yeah, of course all these creatures are going to be angry and feisty. So point being, there was almost a dead goblin in the boat just got eaten by a crocodile on a whim. But I held off. <laughs> I, I continued to hold off. Um, and instead... <laughs> Yeah, the, he he got his a little later. Um, when players bypass areas, can you reuse them later, or are they just defunct? Um, encounters can be reused. Areas like this... I'm going to say not really. Like, it's pretty hard to use chunks of this dungeon now. You know, like, I can't just take this lake out. I can't just take this section and put it somewhere else, really. Um probably could i could like copy and paste it in dungeon fog like maybe that's possible but i just uh yeah um yeah it's it's a little hard and like making up a new area is probably just as easy really like just drawing a new room in a new dungeon um but yeah encounters are the key thing that you can reuse like if i if i want a giant badger creature what is his name? What, what He wasn't a badger. What was he? I forget. So Chat corrected me last time. Maybe it was a badger. It wasn't a beaver, it was a badger. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I can stick that somewhere else. I probably won't. I probably won't do that. But, you know, certainly possible. If they didn't run into, like, the envoy down here from, I forget their name, the Guardian uh, uh, Harpy then that I probably would have reused somewhere else. Let's see. So, yeah, they continued on their adventure. They didn't check out any of these side hallways because they had a guard, and he was like, I don't know what's down there. I just know the stairs are over here. And they walked into this room, and there were two lizard folk just sitting in here, watching the door. Um, and one gets up and starts talking, and is like, yeah, you're Misha. Sure you are. And, like, kind of gestures to the other one <laughs> to, like, go ahead. The lizard folk are less subservient than the cults. They're not really part of the cults. They're, like, they're an offshoot of bad guys. They're more directly under Explicita and not under Misha. So, like, Misha's a lieutenant who has her own baddies, but Explicita also has this other off sh offshoot of uh, guards and minions. And the players didn't really know this. They didn't really realize there was a difference. So, like, they thought this Misha thing had them, like, good to go all the way down to the last boss. Um, but I think, you know, some of the tones I was using with them in here, they were like, oh, we're gonna, these guys are gonna, they're gonna fight us. Um, <laughs> so, like, the one, you know, they, they say, all right, uh, Blaze Gabar, lead, you know, lead my friends forward, and I'll, I'll address this this unruly guard. Um, and so they do. They walk forward. They close the door behind them. <laughs> and um, combat immediately just breaks out in both rooms. And uh, like <laughs> in here, in the first room, I think Eve still pretending to be um, Misha kind of like takes the first attack. Like, once the door is closed, Eve just, like, drops all pretense, draws the um, draws a rapier, and, like, goes to town. I nearly one-shots this guy. Um, and then 
Ben Griff takes a slice. He has, I believe it's called, I called it like the Scale Seeker Sword. It's just a short sword, plus one short sword. And that's all it is against normal creatures. But if you strike something with scales, it acts as a striking weapon. So you have two dice instead of 1d6, it's 2d6. And I wanted it to be even better than that. I didn't want it to be a bad striking weapon that only works sometimes. I wanted it to be just a boss scale killing weapon. Um, so I just threw advantage on it. I was like, if you're attacking something with scales, you have advantage. And uh, <laughs> so Ben takes a slice. I describe it as being like, not like there's not a lot of weight behind it. There's not a lot of um, uh, persistence. I don't know what you call it, conviction. There's not a lot of conviction behind the strike, and it's still it's almost like a sword auto corrects itself and like goes for the neck and slices just clean through the scales. Smoke rises from the scales and the the lizard falls down, and uh, of course. Eve still did most of the damage, but Eve could tell, like, what is wow, there's something up with that sword. In the second room, as the door closes, and the lizard folk in this room, the guards here, kind of um, see their opportunity, two of them immediately, they, they shout out. I can't actually shout out in my current location, so I'm, I'm going to be a little less animated than usual, but they, they shout at the goblin. Um... It's just something along the lines of, like, traitorous fool. And, you know, they leap at him. They beat him down. He goes down and around. He's like, what? What's going on? What, what are you doing? And uh, just immediately immediately goes unconscious. Poor, poor Blaze Gabar. Um, <laughs> and the players get the idea. They uh, they start fighting back against the lizard folk. And they it's a, it's a pretty good brawl. For being the only fight in here, they get knocked down pretty well. They're beefy, beefy boy lizards, um, but they they clean them up without too much trouble. And then they, uh, in the aftermath of the fight, Eve spots a door here that has like a uh, a matching symbol to an amulet that was given to her. Eve is like Eve was the how to put this. <laughs> the not official lover of the emperor that got killed in this campaign. Uh, this whole campaign is like, um, emperor gets rid of the gods. Emperor rules for about 60 years. Emperor dies. What happens when he's gone? Gods are gone. Like, you know, basically just dealing with the aftermath of that is a big theme of the campaign. So, um, he, um, has, Ah, the sister. No, not that kind of unofficial. <laughs> the campaign does not go there. Uh, but no. Um, so the night that he died, he gave her this amulet. She's like, okay, this is weird. Whatever. Thank you, I guess. And then she like leaves, and then he dies turns out that it's murder but um the council is saying that he just died of natural causes and she's like kind of the only one that knows outside of the council um so yeah she just has this amulet she sees that it matches a relief in this door sockets in the door and then the door kind of like folds up and they discover a piece of technology from when this flying city was the flying city um it's like this there's this floating not sentient, but kind of like programmed crystal. I was like, this it's just going to be... They find a room with a medical droid, basically. <laughs> and, um... Yeah, so that it heals them up. They end up spending the night in here. Eve gets, like, another hook of, you know, this room. A, a couple of characters are pretty interested in what the deal is with this room this and this temple. They realize that this is all part of kind of those this ancient floating city and they want to investigate more they're uh, pretty invested in figuring that out and it makes me kind of wish i put more of that here but you know other than hinting at it with like you know these stone bricks with these blue veins in it like none of them are broken they're all just kind of like 
pulled aside, really? Oh, my headset's gonna die. I might need a moment. We'll take that, we'll, we'll take care of that shortly. I'll do an intermission once I'm done here. <clears throat> so yeah, this, this like very durable stone that isn't really broken anywhere, it's just pulled aside, and the only places where it's broken are where it, like it's actually glass that was kind of interlaid. Um, and yeah, <clears throat> so from their responses, uh, they're pretty excited about that, and I'm excited to explore more of it later. Um, and we got to this point, and uh, you know it's a good session when you get four hours in, and all of your players are like, I think I want to keep going. I think I want to, I don't think I want to stop there. So I was like, yeah, okay, we can, uh, I've got enough of the basement done that you guys can keep, uh, keep plugging away. And they're like, great, all right, let's do it. Um, let me just, I have my overlay set pretty dark here. So let me brighten this up. Less opacity. Did that do it? Oh, that was the wrong opacity. I'm silly goose. There's too many opacities. All right. Bam. All right. So. So they walk downstairs. Um and they start exploring this. And they don't really get that far because they run into a combat encounter and combat encounters take up a whole lot of time. Um, so they just explored this this entryway. They saw that there was like a cage of some sort down here. They got, got far enough in here to be like, okay, there's some worm things up there. Let's just nope out of there for now. And they spotted the water down here that of course leads to treasure. And um, they didn't explore all of this too much they came up here, there was, um, there's a white, a, oh, I accidentally, okay, it's fine. Yeah, so this room has a white that looked like a normal zombie, um, and its whole shtick was that, like, if you knock it down once, um, as described in the Against the Cult of the Reptile God PDF that I'm converting this from, um, if you knock it down once, it basically like comes back to life and everyone has to make like a fear save against it. Um, and which everyone did. I think I made the DC a little too low, probably. DCs are higher in Pathfinder. Saves are higher in Pathfinder 2nd Edition than I'm used to from the 1st Edition. So I'm still kind of getting used to numbers. So when I just like get a DC in my head, it's pretty common for the players to just like surpass it easily, all of them. So I need to, just need to tune my brain. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> um, they saved the character that, like, <laughs> basically what happened was they knocked it down, one character started walking forward, and, uh, <laughs> got close enough that, like, the white, I just described the white's head is, like, snapping up and, like, jabbering at him, and he just, uh, <laughs> yeah, so it, he, like, stood back up. That character lost an action, but like took a smack at it, and they were able to defeat it without too much trouble. In the told you to go for no DC. Yeah, you're just feared. You're just done. You run away. Everyone runs. Um, <laughs> should have done. The PDF describes it as only damageable by magic weapons and effects. I feel like that would have been. I'm iffy on that kind of thing, man. Um, not all of the players have magic weapons. All of the players who have magic deal bludgeoning damage with that magic. Like, they have hydraulic push, and they have a, like, a wind thing that does bludgeoning damage. And, you know, they have telekinetic projectile, which does bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage. So, uh, <laughs> I think that if it was literally only damageable my magic, uh, they, they would have had trouble with that. And that's like just an artifact from like old, older D and D. Um, isn't that still magical though? It's, I guess so. I guess so. I guess it would have counted. In which case, this combat ended exactly as it would have anyway. <laughs> Plus one mace is still a magical bludgeoning weapon yet, or it de deals magical bludgeoning damage. That's true. That's true. That's true. Um. Yeah, I think I need to look up for Pathfinder 2 how that works uh, in terms of DR, like, uh, 
for spells. If spells always count as magical bludgeoning damage and such, I think you're probably right. Um, but yeah, I basically just described it as any effect that was magical, um, you know, caused like actual pain from the creature, whereas non-magical effects seemed superficial, but you know, it still did damage. It was just like DR, uh, uh, like resisted by five, basically. <clears throat> um, I'm just playing, I'm just, it's all lens cap, just playing with it because it's clicky. Uh, I'm going to try to stop, but I, yeah, I will try to stop. Anyway, so they bypass that, or not bypass, they kill that. That is like their first kill in the entire dungeon. No, wrong, the lizard folk. Okay. You know, they uh, pick this lock, no trouble. They find that there's a bunch of townspeople here, and, um, you know, they left a bunch of stuff upstairs. They can't just let these guys go and lead them to the stairway. So they're like, um, we'll come back. <laughs> and the townspeople are like, what, what do you, what do you, what do you mean? No, get us out. Get, come on, <laughs> open the door. Um, he's like, nah, I don't, you're just going to die, man. So they, uh, they left him in the cages <laughs> and, uh, peaced out. And yeah, they, it was also around this time, by the way, after like Ben Griff came, he like took a slice out of this guy with again, the magical sword. And then Eve was like, Ben, I think you should give me that sword. <laughs> and Ben was like, well, I, I mean, I kind of like it, but you're pretty good. And if this means that like, I don't have to uh, fight Explicado, if, uh, if you think you have that under control, then yeah, take the sword. Uh, I'd, I'd love a trade if I can have your sword. And he was like, yeah, I, it's a good trade for me. <laughs> Inheriting the reptile god confirmed. I don't know what that was in response to, but I thought about things along that line. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh yeah, and then they ran, they ran into the best named character here. Second best maybe? Keeping their prisoners caged. Yes. Yeah, they'll just be they'll just be taking them prisoner themselves. Um, okay, let's see. I'm gonna power through this last bit before my headset dies. I'm gonna plug it in before you guys get any kind of nasty noise from the headset disconnecting, and then uh, and then we'll move on to the dungeon designer stuff. But yeah, they got to this combat with I'm gonna say second best named NPC in the entire adventure, Gareth Primo. Blaze Gobar is pretty good. Anyway, he is the necromancer that's been making all of the ghouls, all of the whites, all of the zombies that they've been running into. Anything undead has come from this guy <clears throat> or the other cleric that they already killed, but don't worry about that. He was trained by this guy. He is... They didn't really find anything out about him, but he's like a cleric that previously worked in the temple and converted rather early. Um, and... So they run into him. He has another white buddy, Mr. White. Um, and I think this is a cool encounter, but short. I probably should have given him more stuff, more reactions maybe. But he basically casts casts darkness, zaps darkness all in here in uh, this middle area as the players walk in after some banter. Uh, just something about, ah, I, th I see we have guests. Um, I'm a fan of the whites. The, the adventure is a fan of the whites. But I do think that the whites are, uh, they're, they're a cute couple. Um, so darkness was plopped right on the party when they enter. Mr. White runs in and his whole thing is he just has like kind of unlimited attacks of opportunity. <laughs> this was my whole idea is just anyone who attacks him, they get an attack of opportunity. Anyone who walks by him, they get an attack of opportunity. He just goes nuts in the dark as they're trying to like stumble around. Um, but a couple of players went before him. They got out of the darkness. This encounter was over pretty fast, basically. So, like, uh, this guy got, like, two spells off, um, and, like, one, uh, reaction thingy, uh, didn't ever get to animate dead, because there's nothing dead in here. Um, which I should, like, I kind of, I, the only reason he even has animate dead is to call back to the other cleric that had it. So I don't know. I should have forced it to happen somehow. But anyway, 
Um, yeah. So that was uh, that was where they ended, is this kind of mini boss encounter that they managed to beeline towards. Um, and the other thing they did in this room was as soon as this guy was dead, Sonus, the Midwest Paddle, is <laughs> what his nickname is. He's the guy with the big uh, great sword. He walks up, takes the sword, and just baseball bats the head of the snake statue. And I describe it as busting off the head, and you hear the sound of just twisting, busting metal. And uh, when you reveal when you review what you've done, the statue, the head of the statue, had a mechanism that would reveal what I, you know, a secret door in the back of the room. This is what you determine after like someone did like a craft check or something. Um, and it's no longer operable because this, the metal is all twisted up. And someone rolled another craft check to see if they could fix it, and I was like, "Yeah, yeah, you could. It'll just, it'll, it might take like a day. <laughs> might take a straight. You need like a downtime day to do this. And you know. And they're like, "Yeah, we're not gonna do that." And I was like, "Yeah, I kind of thought you wouldn't do that." Um, so they, they lamented that they got, you know, they killed their shortcut <laughs> without finding it first, and they departed. And that's kind of where we stopped for the night. Um, and I was pretty happy with that. I was pretty happy they were excited to move forward with things. Um, you know, like I said, anytime the players are like, I want to, I want to do more. I don't want to stop at the stop time. I want to keep going. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that kind of reaction. Um, it definitely felt long by this point. This was like six hours in. Um, but I still, everyone had fun. Every, no one was like, this was a slog. They were like, man, that was a, that was a marathon and I loved it. So. Um, just catching up on chat a little bit before I, uh, like, switch, uh, get this headset plugged in. My party killed a whole lot of people by setting them on, uh, yep, yeah, setting them free too early last session. Yeah. I, that is exactly what would have happened here. There were a ton of guards upstairs. There were a ton of crocodiles that they haven't killed. They need to escort these people out. Um, <laughs> Cam was very descriptive with their screams. Okay. I imagine he would be. I appreciate that. I approve of that. I'm glad. I, f <laughs> I feel like I've been a little too graphically descriptive in this campaign on that note. I, there's been a lot of descriptive gore, and that's not usually my MMO, so I don't... My MMO. My MO. So. I'm going to try uh, to lay back on that a little bit. But um, I'm going to... Switch views. I'm gonna plug in this headset first and foremost, and then we'll be uh, we'll be right back with some dungeon designer stuff. We'll be doing some prep. So I'm gonna put the music back on and uh, return shortly.